Hi, Randy. Hi, Thank Ellen. you for uh, joining us today. This is an interview I've been looking forward to for a while. Um, and I know you're the band director at Jackson Center, but your students and everybody probably want to know, and I want to know, how did you get into the arts? Uh, it was a fifth grade band. Uh, we did recorders in fourth grade like everybody, but that's not really music. <laughs> at least my students tell me it's not. Uh, but in fifth grade, we were taken to the band director's office and he had us try any instrument we wanted. And I went through the flute because my mom played it, the sax because my dad played it, the violin because my grandfather played it. And after making horrible noises on each one, he would ask me, is there anything else you want to play? And I probably went through all of the instruments before and I finally saw one in the corner and said, what's that? And he said, that was a trumpet. And I said, okay, I'll try that. And so I pick it up and I make a couple of horrible noise on it, and he says, get out of here, kid, you're a natural. So that's how I got the trumpet as my primary instrument. But and when did, I mean, I, there's one thing from just playing it to deciding, you know something, I think I want to do this for the rest of my life, kind of thing. Uh, I actually flirted with this a lot. So uh, I did the band track all the way through grade school, middle school, high school, did jazz band and all that. In high school, I had a girlfriend who made me question everything, and at wow. one point I even dropped summer marching band, which was a big deal. Um, after that relationship was over, I got back in it, so that was kind of a, a renewal for me. Yes, this is definitely what I want. I dropped Chem 2, Physics 2, and Calp 2, and I picked up jazz band, guitar, and marching band. <laughs> so middle was made. <laughs> yes. So I swapped out all my science classes for music classes, and that's how I went through my junior and senior years. And then, still not knowing what college I wanted to go to, the band director of the local university came to solo an ensemble, heard me do a solo, um, and I also did a brass quintet, and offered me a scholarship. And so then I went and talked to my counselor, and I went to the University of Wyoming right out of high school for music performance. Well, that failed after three years, as so many kids' initial college efforts do. And then, uh, I joined the military so that I could learn how to grow up. And then about four years into my six-year tour, I learned what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that's when I decided to go back to school and become a music educator. Well, I know that, I'm going to ask this because I know from when we talked before, your parents were in the military, your dad. Yes. So you moved around a lot yes. for an education. How did that affect, like, you know, you're in this band and then you're not any longer at that school, so you got, it's, you know, you're now you're in a new band. I've actually not thought about it in regards to my playing. Of course, it affected my social relationships horribly. I don't know how to make friends. But the music, it might have actually helped. Um, That's interesting. I'm really good at uh, sight reading. Um, it's one of my superpowers. I'm, I can just jump into anything and just sight read it. Uh, I'm good at playing all styles of music. Uh, I'm flexible. Change doesn't bother me when it comes to music. And uh, so that might have had something to do with it. I got used to that constant change. Well, that's kind of, that is interesting because, you know, a musician, and I'm not one, I'm a, okay, let me just be real honest about it. I am not a musician. I do not play anything in on the piano chopsticks are bad for me. And that's after five years of lessons. So I qualified everything I'm about to ask. But I would think as a musician, because part of it is you have different, you're not playing the same piece over and over and over again. So there is an expectation that you can switch pieces easily. Right, and styles. And uh, I think always being on the move. We never lived in any one city for more than five years. And, uh, of course, being in the military, it is the most diverse community you'll find in America. And uh, I was exposed to everything. Uh, being an 80s and 90s child was really good for the pop music diversity, because um, it got really big then. And, uh, and my parents just listened to anything and everything. So I was exposed to a lot, a, a breadth of music, of people, of situations, uh, cities, towns, states, countries. It would just then you'd have a lot of diversity to bring to your playing. Right, which is funny because actually one of the hardest things for me in college the second time around was to feel a piece. Really? Yes. 
I used to I'm get, actually shocked by that. I, I, I just yelled at by my professor, and he'd sit there in his Italian operetta kind of voice and try and illustrate how I should sound. And I, like that? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, knowing you, I cannot believe that you had trouble feeling a piece. That I, uh, blows my mind. I get too much in my head, and I'm a very rational, analytical, critical thinker, so I think, well, I have to start the vibrato here, and it has to be okay. at about 30 hertz for the beginning 1.6 seconds, and then I need to up to 45 hertz, you know, rather than just feeling the glide into right. it. So he actually solved a lot of my feeling issues by making me sing my lessons. I actually spent more, more lessons in his studio singing than playing my trumpet. I have, I no, I've, I've actually heard that, I've heard pr professors do that with their students, and I didn't actually know why they did it. But. It really helped. It really did, because, well, one, it's not my primary instrument, so I'm not hindered by all the things I right. think I know about it. And two, I was completely uncomfortable with it, so I had to go way over the top to make anything translate huh. from my head to what people were right. hearing. And then that's what really helped me translate the emotion through my horn as well, because I realized I thought I was conveying emotion, but I was just kind of squeaking out a little extra volume, maybe. Right, and was, not really It putting, wasn't enough. Because yeah. um, you can be a technician and not an artist. Right. And, and it doesn't that it isn't pretty. Right. It's just that it doesn't carry that same emotion. It doesn't carry the, oh, I, you know, when, I, I guess, let me put it this way. When people come in and they look at a, vis a piece of visual art in our gallery, sometimes they'll see a piece and everybody sees maybe something a little different, but they catch the emotion. Yes. They're like, oh, this is kind of sad or reflective or something. And to be able to catch that emotion means that the artist had to be able to put it in. Right. Even though their pic what they got, the pictures they got out of it were different, they got that emotion. Yeah. You know, I think that's... One of the more powerful aspects of art. It is. The emotion is, is everything. Um, it's taking a moment in time and translating it into emotional sound or emotional vision or something. Um, you ask people about their relationship with music and very rarely do you get, eh. Oh, that's true. That's true. Almost always it's, uh, I... I just, I always got to listen to this one artist right before I go to bed, or when I'm feeling down, mm -hmm. I put on this song, or, yeah, this is, you know, my soundtrack for summer, and you know, I love these songs, you got to roll down the window. Um, and, and case in point is movie scoring. I mean, the, the whole point of movie scoring is to heighten the emotion of the moment right. that the visual is, is giving you. And So, you have all this emotion that's, um, you put into an instrument, and I happen to know that you teach high school band at Jackson Center. And I, I find that it's interesting that you've got kids that probably aren't real comfortable with their own emotions yet. They're still learning, I have emotions. <laughs> you know? And you're trying to teach them how to play an instrument, put emotion in. How does that work? It's difficult. Um... Because on top of all of that, they are supremely afraid of exposing those emotions. Oh yeah, that's true. In any form whatsoever, uh, I find uh, for my band, it's pop music or pep band music, marching music. They love it. Yeah, the newer the song, the more they love it, and they find arrangements that just speak to them or songs that just speak to them, and they can get into it. And their favorite time throughout the entire year, almost without exception, is during basketball season. And they're in the stands, playing through songs that they know, full volume, and just going for the it. The joy, the exuberance. Yes, yes, the... they love it. You know, um, they get they get fired up, you know, it makes them feel powerful, <laughs> you know, and, and we're lucky that we have um, a lot of kids on our team over the years have come up to us just spontaneously to just say how much they appreciate having us there. And, and we thought, you know, maybe they're just being polite or political or right. whatever. And it turns out they're not. And the proof was after COVID, 
we had we got cut from half the games of the season. So the more popular games, the ones that would bring a lot of guests in kind of thing, we actually were not allowed to be at those games so that they could have more right. of the audience come in. And um, I got one senior who's actually in my music technology course. He's a senior basketball player. And he says, it's just not the same without you. I need the pep band there. It gets me fired up. See, that's, I think to me, I guess maybe the theme for me, because I've been going back to class. Yeah. So in all the class, and I'm taking Middle Eastern studies, and I'm taking things you just would not expect to find necessarily art. But it always comes back to, you know, some form of art, some way or another. People were concerned about this photograph that might be showing this. And I'm thinking to myself, the arts are way more powerful than anybody gives them credit for. Absolutely. And I and sometimes with these kids, and you don't have just high schoolers, you've got them from fourth grade on. Fourth grade on. If they ever understood the power in what they're doing, that this uh, that the arts are an occupation to really make a statement. They're an occupation to really it's their time to put their vision out. And I don't I don't know that kids get that day. We're we're working on it. Uh, we have a fine arts night at our school now um, oh, that's in, in cool. February and we do we have three stages so we have the main stage the little elementary stage around there and then just a makeshift one that we put around another corner and we have performances going every 10 minutes on all three stages uh, we'll have drama performances little improv sketches we have show choirs uh, my bands are doing their winter concert makeup at the fine arts night so okay. we didn't get to do our winter concert in December and there's no way to find a date with musical and basketball season going on right. to squeeze in a, a makeup one in there. But we already have this fine arts night, so they get to play on the main stage for a lot of different people. And then throughout the entire building of these, these two wings that we use, we put up all the visual art. And then there's a silent auction throughout the night, and, um, and we have things going up on the video screens, my music tech uh, classes put out their offerings. I usually have one performance on stage, and we'll have a couple of stations where people can play with the gear and make beats yep. and have fun. So it's a it's a great time. And when we first did it, I think three, four years ago, we had only the hardcore kids were getting right, involved. Right. right. Now, I mean, I look at kids like my fifth graders, my, my junior high kids who've only had, they're just kind of getting comfortable with their instruments. And I say, okay, this is coming up. Who wants to do it? And there's always someone who says, well, can I play something else other than what I play in band? Of course. You can play guitar, you can do whatever. Oh, I so love that. What's fun is these kids, have already they already have their artistic thing, but maybe it's not expressed in school right. in band. And they want to bring it, so then we offer that, that venue for them to bring it, and it's just nice to see them really getting out there and opening up. And I would have never had that kind of courage. Well, I, I mean, that's, I know I wouldn't. I'm sorry, I know that, I know that. You mentioned music tech, and I, that's, even though that's not my program, it's one of them I'm most proud of, because we got to, in some little way, be a part of this. And I want you to explain, because I think that you are the only music tech program in Shelby County. I believe so. I think, I think some small schools outside the county are doing it here and there, but I think for Shelby County it's it. It's, uh, so seven years ago when I got the position at Jackson Center, they asked me, they said, well, can you have an extra spot here and we need you to teach a class and this is where we offer you um, an extracurricular kind of uh, course, you know, like music theory or music history. And I said, music technology. And I really don't know why I said it, because I had no experience in it whatsoever. <laughs> I, so going back to college, when I was in for music education, I had a buddy in the trumpet studio who was from Cleveland, actually, and that was his focus, was music technology. And every week, our whole studio had to turn in these assignments. So most of us just recorded some etude on our trumpet and then right. turned it in. He would always come in with the coolest sounds and these, these crazy electronic things that he could do and I just thought that was so neat. So I think that was just kind of running around in the back of my mind and when I was given a little bit of free reign I said yes I want to do that. So that's how it started was just I want to do that and then uh, I found 
the free programs. I had Start Cheap is free. Yep. So I was using an existing computer lab um, in the school. I had three students. They were all senior boys. And, um, and we had to find everything free or open source. And then so they got to learn a lot about that stuff. And uh, it, was, it was going along fine. But it was actually when I came to you for the instrument uh, program, rental right. program. So Susie had sent me to you and said, okay, go talk to Ellen. She's going to get these kids because we, we have... I think we are the poorest district in Shelby County. If not, I think that you might be right about um, that. I think we have the highest part, um, amount of students in the you know, below the poverty line living at the poverty level. So we have, I mean, every year I'm struggling to get kids instruments. Um, so anytime a kid quits and then their parents say, I'm going to donate the instrument, thank you, thank you. Please open, yeah. so, um, so I came to talk and then I just started rambling with you like I am now. And, and you just took such an interest in that. And I thought, oh, so this, this could be a thing. This is a real thing. And I think that just really helped me. And then your help with the grant writing to get the equipment to move on to the yeah. next level. And then your help with the, <laughs> the, the grants and, and, and what to do and where to go with it. And then I think the best thing that meeting you has ever done for this program was getting those kids to the live shows. That's right. That, yeah, the lights. That is so, they, and it's their favorite part of the year too. They're like, can we get up in the catwalk and go to the lights? And for those of you who don't know, we bring in um, shows. Usually we stay, well, we have Diamond Rio and Osmond Brothers are two that we brought in. And we, Brandy and I talked about it, and I said, you know, why don't we give these kids some real world experience and what it's like to be in a program and have to do lights and sound and they are fabulous. I mean, when they first come in, they'll come in and they just look up like, whoa, where are we? And our sight, sound and light guys will take them under their wings and they're, you know, they've got to wrap up the cords. They've got, you know, they're, and no question is dumb. No. Sometimes they even get to sit with the entertainers and ask them. I have some great pictures of that. That's awesome. Um, and Seth, who now works for us, Seth Regula, was in the first yep. program. He was my one of my three senior boys. Um, and, and I learned everything that I know through the development of this class and being there at those shows. Now I can come to one of these shows and kind of know how things go. But those right. first two, three, four years, I was asking as many questions, if not more, than the kids. And because uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, and the performers loved it. Yeah. And actually, so did the sound and light guys because it's a next generation coming up. Right. And you know, in a bigger city, there might be more of a chance for kids to do this. But here, this was it. It was yeah. just, and it, there was no waiting for, oh, there's no pandering, not pandering, but the word, you know, there's not anybody taking, oh, you can't do this. It's like you're in, you're doing it. Right. And, you know, the catwalks, the kids going up in the catwalks, that's always, you know, I don't think I want to go on catwalks. And <laughs> I actually have more kids afraid of heights than I realized. Well, yeah, <laughs> because you fall from height. And they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say, I wouldn't know this about them until we get up in the catwalk. And then they say, okay, I'll do it once, but no more. Well, you know, some of them, though, they get up there and they'd be putting up the lights or switching things out and then they kind of forget that that's because yep. the stage that we use you don't see through the catwalks which is helpful because I don't know what it would be like to be on one where you could actually see the bottom. No, no. Well and what's fabulous about it is now at this point the older kids so I, I, I offer the shows to the first year tech one. Um, but now I have four years of the class. So I have tech one, two, three, four. I just graduated my first four year last year. That was Bailey. That's right. And uh, I have another four year um, leaving this year. But um, the first years get to go to the shows. But the second and third years like to come back because they miss it. So what I often will do is bring them back and let them lead the others around. And so... I find I'm asking fewer questions. The kids are leading each other. Yeah, um, they're that. talking to the professionals now, and so they're getting more comfortable with speaking with people and asking those questions. They also kind of know the drill, which is yes. fun. They yes. come in and they'll say, you know, if, if someone's not right there, then they're immediately coming up to me, what needs to be done? 
Right. So they kind of know there's a rhythm to this setup thing, that this has to happen and that has to happen. And they're, they're just, they're one of the bright spots of every time we do one of these shows. And every time I can get them an opportunity, I will. Um, uh, Ken got to me about the civic band sound. Mm -hmm. Someone was, you know, their, their um, audio guy was leaving. And I said, I can do it, but I've got little kids. You know, I think my oldest was five at the time. And I did it for the one summer, and it was just... And I know it sounds weird that I'd say five Fridays in a row is exhausting, but it is when you have little kids. But I, I took what your example that we set with those shows, and I said, well, I need to give this to my students. And I did. And every year since, one of my students has run sound for the Civic Band. And um, just the other day, I was helping out at my coworker's church, and she said, bring along some of your tech students. And I said, I'm going to need to because we can't do these shows. Right, without. Yeah, so I, I drag them along whenever I can, and, and we get them out there doing the real thing. And I told them uh, from the very first class, if you know where to plug the cords in, you've got a job. Right, it's, no, that's actually true. <laughs> Just that actually is true. Um, you had two, I think, that have gone from music tech actually into the industry in some respects, or are going into. Right, I um, so Seth was my first, and it was kind of a surprise. I knew he was going into like music business administration. I remember him telling his buddies, he just wanted to manage bands, right? He just wanted to be the guy that booked all the bands and you know all that stuff. Um, I, I don't know how that has changed over the years, but he went off to college, he went to music school, he got his business degree with his minor in music and everything and then he just shows up back here, back here yes. and I went yay <laughs> my first one I went, and, and what's funny is he showed up the year that Bailey who was my first four-year student was graduating um, uh, was pursuing or she was deciding which college to go right, to right. for music technology she still um, her dream is audio engineer so but she like she likes the live and she likes the studio. And so I've got two now that have gone that route and um, I actually have a third. Really? Uh, it's not gonna be music technology, but it's a music educator. And he plays every instrument whenever he can. And he actually audited music tech this first semester. Uh, it was his study hall, but he literally missed two days of class for study hall and then has been actually doing everything that the class has done so we're actually able to sign him up for it next term um so he's just taken all of it and he's fallen in that path and he wants to go into music education so it's fun every couple of years i'm i'm turning out one more that that could go out there and spread the message see i think what i like most about it what excited me most when we talked was as a person who doesn't play an instrument or will anyway. Um, this was an avenue for me. Right. This I didn't have to be an artist. I didn't have to be a musician. I didn't have to be any of these things. I just like you said, I needed to know where this this plug plugged in. I needed yeah. to know that. Yeah. Or just and the arts have a lot more in them that it's available to people that they don't know about. With computers and technology, and uh, it's it's at everybody's fingertips. And that's why I think the music tech was a good choice rather than yeah. the other alternatives because I, I have kids who can't play their sax to save their life, but I listen to their beats on SoundCloud and I'm blown away. Right. Um, they can't read music or they won't, they won't try to read the music, but they have something in them and it's more easily expressed through that electronic medium that they know and that they grew up with. And so uh, I remember when the quarantine first hit, uh, I, I had no software to send home. And most kids don't even have a computer oh, at home. No, I didn't so even how think was I going to teach? I found an online uh, digital audio workstation. I found an online piece of software that allowed you to create beats and that simulated what we were doing in, in the class. And I even showed them. Um, and so I would do little tutorial videos and then I'd post those on Classroom and it would be me going through it. But I, I, I did my whole first beat on my cell phone just to show them, look, you can do this. It's all the same skills, it's just a different format. Right. And so it, we were able to pick right back up and every week we were still putting, they were still submitting a project. They just had to use a different DAW and um, it was interesting. but. 
you know, we can just cut. I mi I miss the kids at the shows. I well, I miss live shows. I miss the kids at the shows. I you know. Yeah, and as you know, because I have to keep telling you, we've rescheduled that one. Yeah. You know, we may miss a whole year, which I'm very sad about that, that that's not going to happen, particularly for the seniors. Yeah. You know, now maybe, may, well, maybe, <laughs> we don't really know. The pandemic has been an interesting thing to get through. Yes. There is one other little program that I want to ask you about because it's, oh, it's yes. a little, it's, it's again, the thing I love most about Randy is that. He's innovative. There isn't, I mean, if I have a crazy idea, one of the first people I think about is Randy. It's like, oh, he'll, he won't say, you're, oh, you're out of your mind. He'll go, let's think about that. <laughs> and then before you know it, we've got this plan and that plan and this, that, and the other thing. And we had a donor, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kemp, and he really wanted kids to have harmonicas. And I ran it through a couple other band directors, and they sort of gave me this look that told me right off the bat, don't call them then. So, of course, I do what I always do. I call Randy. I said, it's how do you feel about harmonicas? And just this winter, we were able to provide a book and a harmonica to your, what, fourth and fifth graders? Fourth and fifth grade, is? yep. It's a general music class. How's that going? They love it. Uh, well, fourth graders love any chance to annoy their, their family. And so that's <laughs> how I get them hooked. That's, uh, the, the prevailing wisdom is don't send kids home with instruments because they won't come back. Well, how do they practice if you don't send them home? Right, so I, I, I made the bold decision to try and send the recorders home this year in preparation for the harmonicas coming. And sure enough, they started bringing them back because they loved to take them home, play it for their family, and then come back and talk all about it. So it was on their mind. So I knew it was going to be fine with harmonicas. So when they heard that they were coming, it probably, from the time I let it slip to when we actually got them in, was probably about two weeks. And it was two weeks of nonstop. When are we getting our harmonicas? When are we getting our harmonicas? And then the next class, so I, I, I'm done with the fourth graders and I go on to the fifth graders next term. They were asking a week ago, so when do we get our harmonicas? I, I said, love that when though. I see you in class. I mean, I, I, harmonica's little. It's something they'll have the rest of their life. And it's fantastic because it sounds good almost no matter what you do. And so you can play around on it. And I do remember one big thing from my uh, trumpet professor, which was uh, how we don't teach by ear yeah. or in, in, anymore in, in, our, in our public music education. We definitely teach. We don't teach by rote anymore. We teach on the page. We, you know, yeah, unless, you, unless you have that's private true. lessons and you're doing Suzuki method or something, it's all about reading music, music literacy, this, you know, and, <coughs> pardon, and this uh, was no more evident than when I auditioned, sorry, Oops, for, uh, when I auditioned for the studio, he had every trumpet player try to play either Twinkle Twinkle or Happy Birthday on their trumpet, given a starting note or in a certain key, and one out of the 12 students who auditioned that year could do it. Whoa! Whoa! So, we're talking college students, right? So... That, that stuck with me, and ever since then, I've made it my mission to do call and response with my kids, to, to train their ears, to get them improvising, and the harmonicas just make it, because with the recorders, we would do it, but if your finger slips off a little bit and you get a squeaky sound, then it doesn't right. sound like what you wanted it to. The harmonica, you can just blow and draw, and it sounds great, and you can go fast. You can go slow, so we're gonna have a lot of fun improvising. Oh, with good! This. I'm yeah. glad. I'm, you know, I, I think it's gonna be a good thing. Oh, I yeah. mean, I know that there is a, a nonprofit out there that was it, for war-torn countries. Okay. And when my daughter went to college, she's also in music education. Um, she went to college, and they she had to work at a nonprofit as part of her fellowship, and they had kazoo's. And they gave kazoos. They would go into war-torn countries after it was safe to go in and give these kids kazoos. And, you know, they had the kazoo orchestra. And when I heard about the harmonicas, I thought, wait a minute. There could be something to this. Because, you know, they're small. They're inexpensive. I mean, we can, you know, thanks to this grant, we can afford to give these kids a harmonica. So they have a connection to music 
and they don't have to, you know, it's not $4,000 they have to cork out to be able to have this connection. Right. I mean, to me, that was just like a win, win, win in Absolutely. this and, and it's that diversity, that trying yes. anything and everything. Why stick on the same path? Recorder, then band, then right. let's let's play around. Let's throw harmonicas in there. Let's let's throw MIDI keyboards and synthesizers. And um, these kids have this new thing called the automaton, and it's this little smiley face music note thing, and it has a slide bar that makes oh noises. Oh my gosh! And it's an obnoxious piece of <laughs> electronics. I got one for Christmas though, and because uh, I needed one of my own. But they would just go walk around the halls playing with these things. Let's get all these oh, let's different see. things in there yeah. and start playing with them. Because the moment you get the kids playing with the music, you've got them hooked. Right. And and you don't you don't have to worry about that recruitment anymore. Well, and music. Um, there's a lot of math to music. People. I mean, <laughs> that is really kind of a myth. People don't know. There's. My daughter once told me. She said it's not. Sometimes it's what you do with the time in between the notes. And I went, what? You know, what do you mean time in between a note? You play this note. You play that. What do you mean time in between a note? But that's true. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of. Um, there's My kids hate it. They, I start explaining a concept to them. They go, "This isn't math class." And I say, "Music is math, or music is science." Right. Yeah. We start talking about frequencies and that's what's right. what's an octave, and and uh, I, I always drag math and science into the classroom, and they groan at me because they were really hoping to just play some notes and. They and really squeak get. and squawk, but then I'm throwing these concepts at them, and uh, yeah. I guess that's why you know STEM is a very. I mean, there's something against STEM. I have nothing against it, but I, I always when they someone says that to me, I said I think STEAM would be a bit more appropriate, because yeah. the arts do use the concepts of science, math. The way the way I always looked at it was this: is that there's always there's a science to every art. Yes. And there's an art to every science. There is a point at which in science you're you're going past what's known. Right. You're creating your right. and that's called art. And that's what the arts teach, is the ability to, you know, to get what's inside and put it out. The ability to go beyond what's currently there. The ability to just be what what think about all the discoveries in science that were intuitive leaps. Correct. Yeah. So that's what I think of when you say that. I'm thinking they had to have that creative mindset, that open mindset. And um, my my son uh, goes to school here locally, and I found out they this year have a STEAM coordinator. And so when the kids go to their specials, you know, right. gym, library, music, whatever, STEAM is one of them. So once a week they go to the STEAM coordinator, and they do different things. They integrate all that stuff. So they did an engineering project, which was just pipe cleaners covered in tin foil. To make a statue, right? So you had the they structure. That was called sculpture. Well, but you had so <laughs> they had the pipe cleaners. She had the engineering right. of the so statue, and then you covered it, and then you could shape it and right. make it your own personal thing with the foiler on the outside. And uh, so, um, it's very simple. Like you said, I thought that was called sculpture. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, you could do that at home. Your, your art teacher probably made you do it. You did it with plaster of Paris on right. a balloon. It's it's when we start to. Put everybody in this little box. You are science. You are right. math. You are the well. No, that's not how life works. Yeah. Life is an integration of all these things, and one augments the next. And they, and you can't leave one out and be okay. If I was born in another era, I would have been called a polymath. Um, now people say jack of all or jack it's of all yeah. trades, master of none. But the full quote is jack of all trades, master of none, but often better than a master of one. Oh, I like that. Yeah, right. And on so, that, I think we're going to say thank you, Randy. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.